to examine. I'm going to take a break from that uh, this, this week and really take a break from it until after Easter, and then we'll take a look at a couple more. But there's one topic this morning um, that does not have to do with our traditions that uh, I want to share with you, uh, one that certainly we've heard before, but there is something about it that I want to make sure that we are squared away on, that we really have it straight. Let's pray before I begin. Dearly Father, I do pray that you give testimony to the truth of your word this morning to us, that you, by the power of your spirit, would be working in the words that are spoken. But I pray that you give me clarity and understanding, um, that really that you would give each of us this clarity and understanding, and that your word really would be alive and transforming for each one of us this morning. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I'm going to begin just by reading a list, a short list, out of Galatians to start with. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, Jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Maybe some of you have figured out how to lengthen, lengthen the list. There's a possibility of that. I warn you. As I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. The truth of the matter is, probably with every one of you, there's at least one, or two, or three, or maybe more things in that list that you've done. And like I said, some of you have found ways to lengthen the list, to add to it. This morning I want to talk about forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins. And what that really means, and what the implications of forgiveness really are. And how that should be playing out in our lives and impacting our lives. And I know that uh, there is an enemy who will continue to remind you of the list. Of the list. And your conscience probably sometimes reminds you of the things that are on this list. And you argue with yourself, question with yourself, Am I forgiven? Can God really forgive that? When I stand before God, what's he going to do about that? What are going to be the consequences when I finally, on that day, stand before the living God? And I think that probably there are people, there are Christians, who have said they've claimed forgiveness and still wrestle with these thoughts in their mind. What's going to happen when I die and I stand before the living God? Having committed these terrible sins, what will it be like? And I know that there are some passages in the Scripture that make people question uh, their forgiveness, that make people wonder if still when I go before God, I I say I'm forgiven, but when I go before God, am I going to have to face that judgment for those sins? And here is one. I'm just going to um, pass over some of the arguments that I think people wrestle with in their own minds and hearts when it comes to their forgiveness. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I think some people apply this passage incorrectly. Verse 12, Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day. And he's talking about the day of judgment. 
will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Now, this passage is not specifically talking about those sins. This is talking about a Christian. It's talking about the work that you do in the kingdom. And some of you will get there and find out that the work that you did in the Lord's kingdom was the kind of things that he was talking about when he says, store up treasures for yourself in heaven, the kinds of things that don't perish. And you'll find out that it's all there and it's going to be tested and it's going to pass through the test. You, you may find out, though, that um, everything you did that you said was for the kingdom um, while here on earth, or much of it that you thought was really good for kingdom's sake, um, really was worldly things, was worldly things, and really won't pass the test. But this is incorrectly applied if we say that we're going to stand there uh, with our sins and be, have them tested by that fire at that point. Listen to this in Revelation that speaks to um, the day. In chapter 20, beginning at verse 11, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. From his presence earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according what, to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each of them according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So that's what the day is like. There are books, there are many books, with detailed things about what was done by each person. And those books will be brought out, and people will be judged according to those things, but he says there's another book. There's another book. In that one book, they open it up, and the only thing in it will be a name. And if your name is in that book, that's all that really matters. Your name is in there, and so you will be saved. It's the one book that matters. So in this life, we choose. We choose Christ, having our name placed in the one book. And then you argue with yourself, though. Okay, um, I was baptized two weeks ago, and I know that my sins were forgiven. I know that my sins were forgiven, but last week, you should hear if you only knew what I did last week. There's no hope. There's no hope for me because of what I did last week. Can that be forgiven? And then we read in 1 John chapter 1, beginning at verse 7, But if we walk in the light, as He is the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So there is provision, you see. Forgiven for sins, we come into Christ. And there continues to be that provision for sin as Christ continues to mediate for us. So intellectually then, we know that our sins are forgiven. Um, we know by Scripture that on that day, it's just a matter of whether our name is in the book or is not in the book. But sometimes I wonder. I don't wonder. I know. I know that sometimes, because I talk to people, that they live this present life as if they had yet to face judgment for those sins. And this has huge implications, not just for us, but for God. If we do not understand that we truly are 
forgiven. Now, you may think that forgiveness of sins has been all about you. You may think that forgiveness of sins is just so that you don't have to face the second death, the lake of fire. You may have thought that it was all about that, just so you do not have to face that condemnation. But there's a lot more to it than that. And I'm going to read a couple of verses, reread, because they've already been read this morning. Um, Hebrews chapter 10. I'm going to begin at verse 19 here. And we're going to find out that it's not all about just that. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that He opened for us through the curtain, that is, through His flesh, And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near. Let us draw near. You know, God chose you, then He created you for Himself. He wanted to be in fellowship with you. And that fellowship was broken by sin. Because sin cannot come into His presence. So what did He do? He made a way. It says that a new way was made through that curtain. Through that curtain. That you could come and be with Him. So it says here, let us draw near. So where you might have thought that forgiveness of sins was all about you. All about you so that you simply would not have to face that condemnation, you need to know that it's a lot about God. It's a lot about God getting back what was rightfully always His. That you could come then and be in that holy place. Draw near to Him. That you could be in fellowship with Him and He could be in fellowship with you. This is the goal of forgiveness of sins, that that relationship could be restored. It's not just about avoiding condemnation. It's about that relationship. And you know how um, in any human relationship, how uh, sin can break the relationship. How forgiveness withheld can prevent you from enjoying all of the blessings inherent with that relationship when it is functioning correctly, when it is unhindered by sin. You know that that is true. And this is what God wants. He wants that relationship with you to be restored. So He has done everything needed to restore this relationship. I know that there is a problem, though. As I said, the enemy will keep bringing up this list of things. You in your own imagination will continue to bring up this list of things. You'll replay over and over again in your mind, in your heart, the things that you have done that are evil, wicked, sinful. No doubt they have happened. And you will continue, sometimes some people will continue to play those over and over again in their mind, even having already taken them to the cross. Play them over and over to the point where they live their life in light of those sins. Live their life in the context of those sins. So that their conscience then stops them from entering into that place, that holy place with God. It stops them from really drawing near. It stops them from really experiencing God. And then it also prevents God from really experiencing you. Before Jesus Christ, they used to offer animals which were only to point to the final sacrifice to come. At the beginning of chapter 10 we read, For since the law was but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true 
form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. It couldn't do it. The sacrifices couldn't do it. Otherwise, they would, have, they, uh, would not, they not have ceased to be offered, since the worshipers, having been once cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sin. He's saying they kept coming year after year after year offering these sacrifices. And they kept coming because those things never really did take care of that consciousness of sin. As a matter of fact, in verse 3 he writes, but in these sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year. So those sacrifices really did have the effect of keeping the conscience alive to those old sins. It reminded them over and over and over again that they were sinners and of those sins that had committed. It reminded them. But there's a new situation now in Jesus Christ. Back over to verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. You see what? Our conscience needs to be different now. We need to understand that our hearts having been sprinkled with the, that effective blood of Christ. Done. Done. So now we think of the one sacrifice and know that it is all done. So we have a new conscience now that allows us to draw near to Him. There's a problem. There's a problem when we live in the context of those sins that are supposed to be done with. In verse 38, he writes, But my righteous one, shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. There are two things, and there's um, a big part of it that I'm just skipping over today for the sake of focus on one. Um, two things about this faith that he's talking about, and one of these is trust him. When he says the blood of Jesus cleanses sin, trust that that is true more than you trust this list that you continue to play in your mind. More than you trust the enemy who will be all too glad to bring up a history that is no longer existent in the eyes of God. That's part of it. That's part of this faith he's talking about. The rest of it is uh, the life you experience in the context of that, which I'm not going to get into this morning, but certainly he deals with right here. And so then if our conscience, if our conscience continues to play through these things, if our conscience, which is supposed to have been cleansed by the truth that our sins are gone, continues to play them over and over, it causes us to shrink back. It causes us to shrink back instead of draw near. So we trust. We believe what God says about the blood of Jesus Christ. And the implications here is, my soul has no pleasure in Him. So if we live in the context of our sins that have been forgiven, you see, God is denied the pleasure that He desires. He's denied that pleasure. When maybe you thought it was all about you and escaping condemnation, there's some pleasure for this in, with this, with God, that He's looking for, that He wants, that He purchased. That He purchased. And when we shrink back because of this overactive, um, incorrect, false conscience then we deny God that pleasure. I'll close with a few thoughts. You're just to try and get you to leave here thinking about the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Verse 10. 
And by that, will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Once for all. This means here, one time for all times. One sacrifice for all peoples and all sin. Once. It is effective for everything. Everything. And you cannot pull one sin out and say, it's not powerful enough to cover that sin. It's too much for that, too much for the blood of Christ. You can't do it. And every priest stands daily in his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. It's done. It's done. It's that one sacrifice that is sufficient. Waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Perfected. Done. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying this, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and I will write them on their minds. He's saying there, I'm going to be with them, present with them. And this comes from Jeremiah chapter 31. He says there that there's not going to be a need to, to be taught those right and wrong things anymore because God is present with them. Then he adds... I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. And that's forgiveness. This is forgiveness. I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, greed, gossip, that whole list. I will remember no more. And maybe you are remembering something then that he has long since forgotten. And maybe you're arguing with God. How could you forget that? You're God. And you might think to get there and bring up the list and say, God, what is going to happen to me because of all these things that I did? It already happened in Jesus Christ. Maybe you'll still argue with him. What about this? What about the list? And he'll say, I distinctly remember forgetting that. I don't remember what you're talking about. Because that's what it means to be forgiven. He will not remember those things. And our conscience, our very conscience, needs to be cleaned of those things. We need to stop living in the context of those sins of our past and begin to be living in the context of God having forgotten them. And what can our relationship with God be like? How can we draw near to Him, knowing that when we do, having confessed all of our sins, coming to Him, knowing that He has forgotten, He has forgotten that whole list. It frees us up to enjoy Him, It frees us up to be enjoyed by Him. It frees us up to be used powerfully by the living God as we draw near to Him. I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Let's pray.